welcome everyone back to the J3U podcast. I'm your host, John Jua. With me is co-host Luke Miller. And today we're going to get into the struggles of the online coach. And the best person to have to talk about this is registered dietitian Chris Tuttle, also IFBB Pro, owner of Tuttle Nutrition, Animal Pack Athlete, and new resident of Texas, like all of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How's it going, man? A good man. I'm freaking loving Texas. I love it. I, I'm actually liking it a hell of a lot more than I thought I would. Um, the Fort Worth area is just awesome. And the only problem is there's not, we don't have a lot of time to like do things yet, you know? So we've been like trying to schedule in as much as we can to see as much as we can, but there's so much to do, you know? What, what, what's the big draw for you? Like what's the big standout? Uh, you're talking about for me coming to Texas or Fort Worth? Um, oh, well, I guess, I guess in general, I guess you like the Fort Worth area. Is there something that you have here now in Texas you weren't ha- having back home? Well, besides the insane savings in taxes, um, and, and the, and the better weather, uh, people are friendlier. Um, but there's a lot more to do in a very close proximity. I mean, like within a 30 minute drive, you have the stockyards. Um, I have all the shooting ranges I could possibly ever dream of. There's gyms. Uh, there's every sort of restaurant and, um, the skydiving simulator place. There, there's just so much to do within 30 minutes. And like where I live, I would have to be driving an hour to do a lot of these things. Um, not to mention how much more expensive they are. I mean, like do the shooting range near my house was 15 bucks, unlimited, unlimited in Connecticut. It's like 30 bucks for 30 minutes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's just all around. Just, I like it better, man. Everything's cleaner. Uh, there's not garbage everywhere. Not that Connecticut has full of garbage, but you get bad areas. I'm sure you do it everywhere else, but here's just, I just like it all around better. Um, I don't mind the heat at all. I know this year in Texas, people keep saying that it's not as hot as it has been. Um, but I, it hasn't, I, I haven't once been like, I have to go inside. I have to go inside. We're in Connecticut when it's cold. You're like, I gotta get inside. I gotta get inside. I gotta get inside. You know, yeah, fam, screw the cold. Like I, I can deal with the heat. Even, even now I'm prepped. Like I'll still do my steps outside. Like I'll go in the middle of the day and I'll, I'll walk outside. Like it's not, yeah. I can deal with yeah. the heat. It's, it's the cold that I, I don't want to deal with. We had that ice storm with this past winter. It was like, like in Texas, you're like, man, I hope it snows this year. This is going to be great. And then it's like shuts down the city. We're like, you know, fuck the snow. Like never, I never <laughs> want to live with the snow. It, it was just miserable. So I'd rather have hundred degree weather any, any time. Um, God, it's like that for like four months. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I agree. I think doubt, like I, we want to move to Dallas. Um, I think it's just, it's such a clean city. And like you said, I'm sure there's like areas you don't want to go to, but Overall, it, it is really nice. There's so much, so much to do out there. So it's a big draw for yeah, sure. Yeah, and like the thing is, this, we, we, we uh, went around Fort Worth, like the center of the city there, like where all the like, restaurants are. It's just, it's just beautiful. It's clean. Yeah. Uh, the, the, and the food was, the food is so much better and way cheaper to eat, which is nice. It's easier to navigate. There wasn't like an ass load of traffic like you get in New York City uh, or in Boston. So it's just all around is better. And I know there's like a, there's an air show coming up soon and the state fair. So, I mean, these are all things that are just yeah. like super close, you know? We better stop like giving out all the Texas secrets. So it, it's just for us. <laughs> no, don't, come don't come here. Don't come here. title. I like my little. <laughs> I know. I know. That's what everybody keeps saying. You know, people are like, where are you from? And I'm like, Connecticut. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like glad you escaped all right now yeah 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 well cool we'll get let's get in and chat about what we're actually going to talk about today which um having you on and, and like with all three of us like we we coach and there's always these issues that come up and i i've i've always been entertained by like your tuttle rants you put on ig because it's like the same issues that we all come across but i think it, 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 there's some good takeaways, at least from client perspectives within that, because people miss the mark within it. And we all get into coaching with just this ideal optimal approach to give to clients. And then you probably kind of quickly realize like that it doesn't cater to everyone and that there's many like obstacles to work around or things that you just didn't even know to ask a client that they would get, you know, to start to do. Um, but I think a big thing of coming in with, well, at least when I was first coaching too, and I, I made the mistake of, 
um, managing expectations. I think that's a huge one, especially and because we're, I, I think the focus for us, like we mainly have competitors that uh, is, is our real niche. So, I mean, with the general pop, it's a little different, but um, even with competitors, the expectations are, are just, um, they can be way high most of the time and unrealistic outside of just even your normal sports. Like I, I don't have too many, I, I'll give you like a quick thing. Like I worked at GNC for like six years and I had, the, I remember it stood out in my mind. We used to have a BSN like whole section, right? And Ronnie Coleman was on these little like pictures with the products. And I had someone come in, they're like looking through the products and they're like, man, I, you know, I want to put a little size on, but they point at Ronnie and the pick is like, but I don't want to get that big. Like dead fucking serious. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, dude, no worries. <laughs> You'll never get that big. <laughs> so um, there's some unrealistic expectation within bodybuilding of, of the genetic limits within a, this sport or sport, if you call it that versus like basketball, like, Hey, I don't, I don't want to get to the NBA level. It's like, Oh, don't worry, man. You're five foot seven. And, and you know, <laughs> you're not going to, you're not going to get there. But um, what were some of, what are the main like expectations that you had to kind of manage around with, within your, within competitors? I could talk a lot about this um, and just the mentality in general. I've always been someone who competed in individual sports. So my own expectations of what I'm capable of, what's a realistic progression what defeat feels like from wrestling to motocross to bodybuilding was formed earlier on. So the transition to bodybuilding, I never had unrealistic expectations ever. And believe it or not, I was always like, man, I'm working hard, but I know wherever I go, there's going to be somebody better than me. And I always had that mentality. Like I need to do X, Y, and Z every day. And I hope X, Y, Z every day is going to be enough, but we'll see. That's always been my mindset because I know what it's like to, think you're Johnny badass on a dirt bike you go to your regional show your regional race and you get dead last like four times you know what I mean like then I'm like oh my god there's people out there who can really ride so even though that you might be better than your own group of friends um and that's one thing that I didn't address either when I first started coaching because I I guess I ignorantly thought that people thought like me you know, we're like, I don't need to do that. This is what you do. And you follow this and you get results where they had a lot more mental expectations or the opposite, a very negative mindset of themselves where they, they're, they're like, you know, there's one thing to say, I'm not good enough, but to beat yourself up over not being good enough and feeling bad about yourself. So those are kind of things that I learned to try to combat over time and ask because what many people don't realize is even if you follow a diet that's sound, a training that's sound, supplement protocol that's sound, if your mind is not in the place it needs to be, those responses to those individual things are not going to be optimal. It's just not. Your body does follow the set of your mind. If you're in a horrible place mentally, your body's not just going to respond the same way. It just won't. And um, that's one thing that I know that I've seen too, I'm sure you guys have as well, is the athletes that you get that hire you that come in with that great mindset, their prep is like a breeze. It just, everything clicks, they respond well. And you're like, wow, I'm a genius. This is amazing. And then you get somebody who's got better genetics, who their mind and stress is all over the place and their expectations are this, and they're staring at Flex Lewis, wondering why they're not that shredded at four weeks out. And, and then their body's just not responding and they're holding water and you're like scratching your head. You're like, what is going on here? You know? Um, so I really try to pre-prep them mentally before prep starts. And obviously as prep goes on, it's more or less, I don't want to say hand holding, but it's constantly checking in because I, in my experience, I think 70% of people don't tell you, they just don't. Yeah. Everything's going fine. Yeah, okay, how's everything really going? I noticed some things are a little off here. Well, come to find out, last two days have been really tough. And they start telling you, like, I was at the gym and some guy made a negative comment on my back. And then I couldn't sleep that night and I was stressed. I got to fight my wife. And then there all of a sudden, all these things come out, you know? <clears throat> yeah, I think, like, at least when I start in my assessment, I have, like, goals, it, you know, within to hit and within those goals, I can see kind of what their expectation might be. A lot of times it's like pro card, right? And it's like their first year competing or something. Uh, it's like, okay, 
and then you can kind of build off that framework too. And also like rating their, their like current stress level, what their occupation is, how many hours they work a week to try to pull out some of that data set. But I, I, I think I definitely hear a lot of people don't address it too. And I especially get that with like male competitors, the, especially like you're like, more macho, like, hey, just give me the plan, I'll suffer, bro, and it doesn't matter. It's like, no, no, that's actually not the best kind of client that I have. And it's, there's a perception that that client is, is ideal, right? The one that just, I do the plan and I don't complain. It's like, well, some of those complaints from that type of person are actually the stuff that you do need to hear because there's also like going too far. And it's important feedback. It's important feedback. Yeah, you just you, you won't you won't hear that from that person. But I think even in modern modern day, there's so much struggle with with what's put on us from a job aspect, competitive aspect, relationship aspect, and the stress levels, the, the amount of um, people with that struggle with anxiety and depression. It, it's it's almost a norm for so many people that you don't hear about, where you get that opposite client, like you said that they have such a negative self image of themselves and maybe they undershoot it, but they can go rabbit hole with a little thing like, Hey, they woke up and their scale weight was 0.2 pounds up. And they're like, it sends them down to like, all of a sudden they're not good enough. Um, and to even darker places and it's stuff that they, they might be embarrassed to address within a coach. So I think having at least within your check-in and I know Luke, you have this right at the bottom. What, what is your, what do you, what do you actually word it? Mental, um, like mental, mental, uh, not mental sanity is like mental expectations for the week. So it maps out how they manage it the last week and then how they things that they're going to use within the following week to manage it better. So like common ones I'll use will be like self-awareness tools, kind of like a tally system in order to like start to gain that perspective of doing the dailies and how that contributes to like the longer one. And so that's kind of where that whole bottom in section sheet's at. Yeah. Um, you, you know what's, what I tell a lot of my clients sometimes too, is I, I, you know, people will idolize champions, right? And they'll, I, with any sport. But the first thing that people usually look at is what is his training program? What supplements does he use? Nobody's being like, man, what kind of mindset does that take? I wonder what type of mental meditation or self, you know, maintenance he does mentally for himself to keep him on his game. How can Serena Williams be one point away from a million dollars or $5 million and half the crowd hates her and the other half the crowd loves her and all this pressure is built. How does somebody like that maintain focus and not make mistake and still be able to perform? Nobody asks those questions. People want to know, I got Serena Williams sneakers and I got her tennis <laughs> racket, but let's focus on, the most important thing that what's really separates people from who continuously succeed and who don't is not necessarily the bag of tricks they have in their pocket. It's their outlook and their approach to how they handle those tools. You know, um, I have to say personally, Evan Sanpani was always like, you know, I was friends with him early on back in 07. And I just knew he, he was abnormally of a headstrong person. And at the time I was a little more thin skinned, and I idolize that. I'm like, man, I gotta, I wanna be like that. Like, it just seems like he, he can't be influenced in the wrong way. He sticks to his guns. He's not one that made emotional decisions in his decision with competing and prep. He was just on an even keel like all the time. And obviously to some degree that can be genetic, but I look at a lot of the times what you're able to accomplish mentally, sky's the limit. It's what you believe you can achieve Versus people saying, oh, that's just the way I am. I get stressed like that. I'm like, really? Because we're all human. We all have distinct physical attributes where we can't change. But you can mentally learn not to react to things. You can mentally learn over time to manage stress. You can learn mentally over time to become tougher. You can learn mentally over time to change your outlook, which I think a lot more people need to put emphasis on versus what's the new greatest new ways to do RDLs. You know what I mean? I think, I think sometimes too building the progression across that like I just pulled up my sheet to be a little bit more specific it's mental and emotional stress is the category that's probably most applicable to that in my sheet and it's a color-coded portion of the sheet so it's like a one through five and they can see where they're at with like green yellow red depending on where that mental emotional stress is and then across the weeks they can see it improving as some of their self-awareness things in the sheet start to improve as well 
because now we're creating wins for them to pull them out of that like constant negative loop in order to move them into that better awareness that will allow them to um, gain that perspective that allows them to hit the long-term goals within the day to day. Yeah, I, I like that. And one thing too, I like to mention to people is like, it's when you're checking in, when you're, you're talking about where you are mentally or filling out your progression sheet, it's based from the change of your baseline. How many people do you get when you say, Hey, are you stressful job? Oh yeah. Super stressful. I'm stressed all the time. Okay. Okay. But that's your baseline. All right. So when we're talking about change over time, we're talking change from your baseline. Obviously, if I say to him four weeks later, Hey, how's it going? Oh, dude, I'm still stressed. Okay, yeah, I, I get, I get it. I get you stressed, but is there a change from stress from your baseline? Because we're making changes based on consistency, not you always being stressed. We get that, but like, if you're always at an eight stress, are you still eight? Are you eight point five? Are you two? Are you a ten? You know, yeah. uh, John. What's funny is this is a classic example of not communicating. I had a client once. He was ex marine. He's a, he's a police guy. Um, he was always great to work with. And this dude was shedding body fat like you wouldn't believe. And I kept saying to him, I'm like, dude, you're, you're, are you sure you're good? Dude, I feel fine. Awesome. I'm like, yeah, but you're making leaps and bounds every week, like way faster than you should. I'm going to add food back. And he's like, all right, just for one day, but I'm totally fine. I promise. I'm like, okay. Just give him a little refeed. Weight still drops. Progressing. Your strength good? Yeah. Strength's great. Pumps are awesome. <laughs> Four days later. His wife messages me. He's like, he passed out at work. I'm like, wait, oh, what? What do you mean he passed out at work? He's like, yeah, he was standing guard and he passed out and he hit his head. I'm like, what? And he goes, he didn't mention to you? I'm like, mentioned to me what? He goes, he's been getting dizzy all the time. I'm like, he's never mentioned he's been dizzy all the time. He's like, yeah, I'm in the car with him now. We're on the way to the hospital. I'm like, dude, hold on a second. Don't go to the hospital. Go pull in the Dunkin' Donuts real quick. And she's like, what? What do you want to do? I'm like, have him eat a muffin. And then in 10 minutes, let me know how he feels. He eats a muffin. 10 minutes, he's like, I, this is gone. I feel great. I feel fine. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're just like, you're like bottomed out hyperglycemia all the time. You got to tell me these things. He's like, yeah, man, I just want to feel like a bitch. I can handle this shit. I'm like, I know you can handle it, but it's like prep is not beast mode. It's more like a chess game. You're being a little more strategy. Yeah, you got to be tough mentally, but there's strategy involved. I need to know these things. <laughs> yeah. Perfect example. No, that's it, man. like I'm that I'm, I'm like that. Like I'm willing to go and push myself before I pull back. Like my first three shows I coached myself and which was a nightmare uh, mentally and emotionally because I was very emotionally driven then. Um, I didn't know how to separate myself mentally from, from that and react. Um, those emotions can kind of still be there, but now I've, I've kind of been able to harness that reaction to it. But anyway, I would keep pushing, pushing, pushing to where, I, at school, the university, you know, you park far from campus. Like it's just, you have, it was like a 20 minute walk to class and my legs were just fried, just so fried because I was doing at the time, this is when hit cardio was like, this was the way to do cardio. Now it's, yeah. you don't do steady state, hit burns more fat. It tame, holds muscle while I was doing, I bought a, a, a recumbent, recumbent bike at home. So I would do sprints. Then I would go walk for like two miles. Well, that trashed my legs but that was the way. So whatever. Um, but I was walking to class and man, I was barely moving. I had to be slugging along and I just stopped in the middle. And I, I was like, I think I'm going to sit down. I think it was sit down or walk back to the car. I was like, I don't know if I can keep going. It, it was, it was that bad. And just thinking back, it's like, God, you idiot, what are you doing? Um, you should have just like backed off. And so now like you said, it's a, it's this chess game of like, it's not always push, 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 chase suffering. No, it's like chasing this ideal uh, physique that we want. And you, you really do have to know when to pull back and when to push. And that's when that feedback is just so important, but that's, that was my own self-coaching like experience, which was valuable. And I value being at like self-coaching now because I have no way to be a scapegoat for myself, you know? Um, and I have clients that I feel like sometimes we serve as a scapegoat for them and more of a police. And they're like, well, Hey coach, I checked the nutrition block. I checked my cardio block. And, um, then they can find any ways to make it like easier or get off plan. It's like, oh, you had 
you can have one diet soda per day or something. And it's like, ha, well, I had a fucking three liter. It's like, you're, they're just trying to find ways to work around. Then if they get to their show, it's like, oh man, I was off. Well, this is because coach had me. It's like, and you serve, serve that role, but coaching yourself, that's off the table. It's just you. And so you have to constantly evaluate, how can I be better every day? And there's more self-evaluation that occurs. So having a coach is no reason why you shouldn't still have that self-evaluation and being able to that same internal monologue, you need to be conveying a lot of that to your coach because there's, there's always an, a better way to do it. And that's what I found, how I've perfected more of my process along the way is always, always this self-reflecting on what I'm, where I'm at mentally or physically and how can I continue to improve and, and putting it on myself, having that self-responsibility in that. Um, Cause even as client, you're still self-responsible for, for those actions. You, you just, you just said something that's, it's, I, I, I talk to Lex about this all the time. Um, and this is outside of bodybuilding too, slightly off topic, but the same topic is I always just say to her, I don't know how people go through life becoming a worse version of themselves as in to become more eccentric in the poor personality traits they have. Because in my opinion, bodybuilding or whatever you do in life, the whole goal is to become a better person, better version of yourself. That requires insight. So I think that is something that a lot of people either don't just don't have, or they don't care to have, or they refuse to have because humility, insight, self-reflection, being able to look back and to see very closely what went wrong, what could have changed, and how to implement them and move forward and change is a skill that people just don't have or they're not willing to have or they're not willing to try to work towards. I would say all the clients I have, very few have that right off the bat. And I do believe that self-coaching does kind of forces you to have that because there's no scapegoat or person to blame except you have to look back at XYZ and figure out what went wrong and what you can change because it's on you. And that goes to the question people always ask, should I coach myself at least one time? I think everybody should. However, as you may know, and I, I agree, and this is not a dig at any many people, but I would say 50% of people who compete today wouldn't be competing if there was no coaches yeah. because the, the confidence is not there to do so, um, to figure it out themselves or put in that work, or they'd say, screw it, this is not worth it. Or there's the afraid. Some people like to have, you know, I'm going to get into this. So I'm going to hire a coach to figure out what you need to do versus I'm going to pick up all these books and figure it out, process elimination. Um, but that's very important. And like you said, man, I, I, same situation, looking back at some of the things I've done, I've self-coached myself a few shows and <laughs> the fatigue you put yourself through. I remember, I remember going like, you know, some days you have good days and bad days in prep. And some days I felt too good. I'm like, dude, this is too many carbs. I'm start. I'm driving to school, flicking out sweet potatoes out the window. I'm like, I'm gonna mm -hmm. cut the carbs out half today. I don't feel shitty enough. Like having that mentality, it's just like I don't think I'm suffering like I'm supposed to, <laughs> even though the results are there. Um, but self insight and self reflection and taking responsibility, even if you're with a coach, kind of looking to see what could have been different, is overly important. I mean, I've worked with a top coach. And the first prep worked really well. The second prep was a disaster and it was in the same year. I'm not sitting there blaming him at all. It's just sometimes the body does things you don't want it to do because at the end of the day, I always tell people the body's like a wild animal, right? You can try to coerce it into your little den and trick it or the wild animal's going to be like, fuck you. I'm not doing that, you know? And prep didn't go as well. I didn't look at all good and things went wrong, but I'm not going to, you know, there, I could come up with a list of things that, I could have done differently. Maybe he could have done differently, but overall the communication has got to be there, even though you're following the plan designed by that person. <clears throat> yeah. Even that's another part of it too. Like you can have the best coach and the best plan and everything, but sometimes just the body response. Like I, I've been in prep for a very extended period of time and to pull back down into the Olympia, it's taking more than yeah. what it has because I've been in this prep. And, and so it's not like, man, John, you're, you're, I'm missing the mark in my coaching or no, it's just, this is the body's response and how yeah. I have to now change the plan accordingly to do so. So sometimes it is just the body and you have to know, Hey, maybe it's time to just, we do something, a different plan or approach. But um, I, I, I think what you said is, is interesting as far as like, at some point you should maybe coach yourself um, 
I, I would say my mistake was coaching myself off the bat um, and trying to, I would try, of course I was learning all the way, but I, I think having a coach from the beginning that just gave me kind of helped me learn my body faster um, or not my body, but just in general, kind of like the, the route to go. But then I think instilling in our clients that autonomy and pulling out that self-reflection to where they could get to a point where they can almost coach themselves. And do you have, do you have any process that that would even look like for someone like to build in more, more of that kind of like, like to where they're a high end client and they're just like, can do stuff on their own, you know, like, like example for me would be someone moving from a strict meal plan to where, Hey, we're maybe just give them macros and they need to program out their own food choices or something like that. Um, I don't know, do you, do you, do you kind of tr try to progress your clients up to where they're, they're have more of that uh, autonomy and, and just own, own responsibility in their own plan? My general weight loss clients, I do all the time because at the end of the day, it's all about sustainability on their own over time, over a lifetime where they can achieve their healthier look, healthier body, better improved blood lipids. Um, same similar concept in regards to some of my clients I have in the off season where like, they're like, hey, Chris, can I swap out this for that? I'm like, yeah, man. It's, it's, at this point, 75 grams of carbs, 75 grams of carbs. Like, it's totally fine. Not a big deal. And they can go in that direction. But in regards to people getting them to prep themselves, that's a decision they make. I don't push that. Um, I've had people, I've had friends, like my clients become my friends. And then they end up prepping themselves. And then they're like, hey, Chris, do you mind if I send my pictures to you like six weeks out, four weeks out? Just kind of give me your thoughts. I'm like, yeah, no problem. Just so they have like somebody in their corner being like, yeah, dude, you're on track. This looks okay. Yeah. Oh, I might want to step it up. I have quite a few clients have done that who become friends and I've done it that way. And they kind well, of- I've, I've seen you my picks before. Yeah, yeah. You I've know? done preps like that because at the end of the day, sometimes it's important to be like, man, like I feel like I look good, but maybe I'm seeing myself not as I am because we rarely see ourselves exactly how we are. And then be like, hey, what do you think of this? You know, it's always good to find that honest friend. I had an honest friend growing up when I used to prep myself. And I'm like, dude, what do you think? He's like, dude, you need to step it up. <laughs> he would never be like, you're fucking awesome. He'd be like, I think you're okay. I think you're on track. Or you need to step it up. You look really flat. Like he's just flat out. Where everybody else is like up your ass being like, bro, you fucking peeled. You're going to win. And he's just like, yeah, you're probably not going to win. <laughs> you know? Um, but my first show, I hired somebody to help me. And then I got the experience and that experience created, okay, I, I think I got an idea of what to do. And then my second, third, fourth, fifth show, I prepped myself. And then that was obviously all learning and improved. And then the last show I prepped myself in that order was a disaster. And then I'm like, man, I have no idea what I did wrong. Like I need to hire somebody now to help me make better decisions. So I don't make 20 years of mistakes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then I hired somebody else who was better, more experienced. And I learned even more. And then I prepped myself again after him and I did well. So it was kind of like, you know, you sometimes you don't want to go two, three years making mistakes when somebody could be like, you're making a mistake. This is an easy fix. Do you know what I mean? Versus going through it thinking like, yeah, got it. But then again, <clears throat> I'm 38. When I first started competing, there was no coaches really. There yeah. was no Instagram. There was no internet. There was no, you know, coach bashing. There was no, this coach does this, this coach does that. It was just the guys in the gym. And at that point I look at the owner who used to compete like 40 years ago. And I'm like, Hey man, does this side <laughs> chest look okay. You know? And that's how I had to learn and progress because you know, that my corner of people competing was this big and only people I knew, I didn't know anybody I was competing against. There was no like, so-and-so's doing that show. Did you see him? I had no idea. You know, you just show up and that's just there. Do, do you think that has improved or dropped off the quality of competitor? Now that there's so many coaches around and there's less reliance on that self-awareness or do you think just having coaches now is it, it, it could go either way, depending on the person, probably. You know, what's really weird to say it, it's, it's a, okay. So I remember most people being in really good shape and light heavyweights being 15 to 17 people deep. Okay. Yeah. Because for one, there was no men's physique. There was no classic physique. It was bodybuilding figure women's bodybuilding. That's it. Okay. Now 
And also you're coming from an era where there wasn't coaches. It wasn't that common. So people who were competing, who were already doing it themselves for years. And then the other aspect, the number of shows was like an eighth of what it is now. Yep. Like near me, I remember I had to wait every year. There's only three shows within a three hour driving distance per year where I was. Other than that, I had to fly across the country. So you get more people doing one show, you get more competitive people, more people who are more serious. Now I feel like there's so many shows, so people are broken apart, so classes are smaller. I feel that everybody thinks they can do a show. I think society, I hate people gonna say, I mean, not even saying this, but whatever. Societal norms in general is more lazy, lackadaisy, don't have that same grit in them. Um, so you get people who are, in far better shape than they were when I first started, a small percent. And then you get meteor, medium, and then you get a large quantity of people who shouldn't be on stage at all. So it's kind of like a mix, but I couldn't say overall, it's just better. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because the average is not better, but you have better top guys. I think we've, we've expanded the divisions out now to where it, to allow more people to to see it's achievable and, and not to take away from like men's physique or classic or anything like that because there's guys that are exceptional and work very hard but there's also just a lower level of development that's needed or sometimes a lower level of conditioning toward it seems more achievable um which you pull guys from bodybuilding oh i'm not gonna bodybuild because that could be a six-year endeavor to get really good Versus this two-year endeavor where I could maybe get become pro then or you know whatever it may be, but then yeah, it's the pool has diluted down, and then there's also more pro cards giving out, so then you have more guys moving up, and so now your lower level shows, um, the the pool is just a, a little bit less competitive. Um, so a lot, yeah, a lot a lot of factors within that, but at least with within coaching, I, I think it kind of goes either way. Like everyone's a coach, that's a problem. But then you have exactly. access to a lot of information on what's kind of bullshit and what's not. Um, so uh, yeah, I agree. It's kind of it's kind of mixed. Uh, it's I, a multifaceted thing. Yeah. And one thing you said about I think the one thing that the coaches have brought. This is just too many coaches who shouldn't be coaching. I believe you have a lot more people ending in the hospital, getting hurt, dying, if it, if it like if that wasn't there, because those types of people may not necessarily taking 200 milligrams of orals a day. You know, they would have looked online, looked up Bill Llewellyn's book and be like, Oh, a max dose of Winstrol is 50 milligrams. Okay. I'll say 50 milligrams versus going more and more and more. Because I remember when I first started competing an average off season cycle was 300 megs of DECA, 750 test and 30 megs of D ball. Like that was considered a fairly heavy <laughs> cycle. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And now you have people cruising on 500 megs of test and 300 megs of EQ, you know? So it's, it, the, that's been a linear progression, you know? Yeah. It's scary to think like what we see guys using now, um, where that's going to be in 20 years for them, like health wise, which I, I think that gets into another, like an issue that I come up with clients is just uh, medical access and also budgeting for that access. Um, yeah. So I have a lot of problems like with clients that, hey, I, I want a yearly echocardiogram done. I want labs done every 10 weeks. Uh, there's costs associated with those. Like you might be me pay $1,000 for an echo um, for your labs. That could be $200 a pop. Um, add that up for the year. Hey, maybe you're at two grand. Of course, it's like, oh, no, I can't afford that. But I can afford a thousand dollars a month for growth hormone, or I can yeah. pay for this show, or it's just enough, just enough budget for like your, your coach and your drugs, no health supplements, no lab work, and, and just enough for the show. I'm like, Hey man, can we add in this supplement? Like, Oh man, um, let me put that in the budget. Maybe I can get it in a few weeks. I'm like, what do you do? What do you mean? Like you need like, this is expensive sport to prioritize, but it's, it's a challenge to, to, and depending on what state you're in to get people, just get lab work done in general. Do you come across that with, with your competitors? We're a little better here in Texas. I don't know how Connecticut was for. Um, Connecticut was fine. It's New Jersey and New York that are yeah. no good. Yeah. yeah they're, they're just, I don't know what their deal. I don't know what the problem is. 
Um, yeah, it was, it was a challenge, but even, even within that, like I'll can have people do like, what's nice now with the advancements, uh, is like, um, like a Dutch test or like saliva test. There's some like finger prick tests that they can mail in. So at least there's something that could be done. Um, but a I lot think- of times people just don't want to do it. Yeah. You know, it's, too. it's like, and, and like you said before, and this kind of brings up another whole nother topic in regards to, you know, being a better coach, changing the industry, et cetera, is you always will have groups and subgroups of people that want to do different things. They might look at you or me and be like, man, those guys are a little too health oriented for me. Yeah. Conservative. You know, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm, I got, I got to go with somebody else. And like, you always know who wants to take the most drugs based on who they're working with. Or I was like, ah, you just want to take a bunch of drugs. I got it. Um, or like they work with this person because they identify with that particular person. Oh, he does everything to failure and trains like branch Warren and bangs his head against the wall and takes tons of Andrew. I want to be like that guy. And then you get the people, no matter what you tell them, they're going to go in that direction. And then what many people may not know who listen to this is like, I'm sure you have too. I've had a lot of people contact me under the age of 35 kidneys, toasted congestive heart failure from gear use. And they want to still bodybuild. Yeah. They're like, Chris, I know you're a dietitian. Can you fix me? I know I can't. Like, you're done. Oh, what do you mean I'm done? I'm like, dude, you need to worry about bringing your body weight down, living a healthy life. You have two kids. I like focusing on other things of life and prolong your your kidney health because you're going to need to transplant eventually. Uh, you know, I think I'm going to work with somebody else. And, and they'll just go find somebody who will tell them what they want to hear. And then they'll eventually die. And then we're all beyond. Then everybody is on the thing. On RX muscle being like, I'm shocked. I'm yeah. shocked that people are dying. It's like, I'm not because there's those people out there. Um, the only thing I will continue to do, and just like you will, is my integrity is first. And when you're coaching people and doing <clears throat> recommending health and telling them, you listen, this is not good for you, but these are the things you need to do, I will continue to do that because this is a weird way of saying this. I feel that a lot of people coming into the sport are clouded by the recognition from others and their desire and emotional need to succeed that they bypass their health for a plastic trophy, for a little pro card we have to pay money for. And then at the end of the day, 10 years from now, they're going to be like, what did I do? What did I do to myself? And that's where like, like, (laughs) I know they're going to think that. I know they're going to think that. And like, I'm not willing to just be competitive with somebody else just to do all the shit they want to do because another coach does that. Um, and, and that's why I think where people need to be pulled back. It's like, Hey, you know, going from, for example, someone, someone says to me, Hey, you know, this Anavar is working great. Like I feel awesome on it. What do you think about doubling it? I'm like, well, if it's, if it's working so good now, why would we double it? You think you're going to get double the effect? Probably not, but you're going to get double the side effect and potentially make your lipids 10 times worse, which potentially take more years off your life, you know? yeah it's in with everything that i'm trying to put out it's for one i've done the opposite i've been the young guy that wanted the pro card and that was all that fucking mattered i mean it was like it would if i could die doing this and i it didn't fucking matter it was stupid and i was i ran grams into shows and didn't do blood work because I didn't want to see the lab work. Um, thinking that the approach I was using was still like, that's what must be done. And that's not what I'm putting out either. It's that, hey, we want to be awareness. And so when we do get 10 years down the road, it's not like, oh man, I have heart failure. I don't know how this happened. It's like, no, we pick up the warning signs and we can do something about it. But also I realized too, like, that you don't need to go to that extreme. And that's what I've pulled out that you get a lot of cookie cutter approaches and you end up trying to make sure that you leave nothing on the table, right? Well, Hey, I don't want to use too little as a bodybuilder. Well, screw it. We're going to put everyone on three grams of gear a week. And that way we make sure that they're growing and making progress. It's like, well, no, this should be based off a needs analysis of what that individual needs based on their level and their health. And so let's start, all I'm saying is like, when I was that age, I only thought about the next 20 weeks of prep. I didn't think that when I was 35, I would still be competing and be going to my third Olympia. 
I was just worried about the next show I was doing. Going back then, I'm like, oh, shit, I should have been planning this out for the next 10 years to compete. And that's what I want to get the most out of the least and keep that progressing over years. Because we know in bodybuilding, you have to do this for years to get good. So it's like use the least to get the most before you need to keep escalating up. We monitor health along the way. So we know like, hey, X drug you shouldn't take because that really screws your lipids. Let's do this instead. So we find an individualized approach that can give you that longevity in the sport and not end up down the road. And I'm not saying that this is going to be 100% without risk. It absolutely is. And you're absolutely doing damage. But we can at least try to mitigate it some, right? Right. And, and But I think the most important thing about you as an individual is, you know, anybody can speak what we're speaking. But when you have somebody like yourself, that is accomplished what they have in bodybuilding using as little and being that taking that approach that is more of like hey dude see i did it i can do it i can show you right it's like i miss my mark you know um i was never a good pro so like my word only carries so far but thank god when someone like yourself has done it and does that approach you can prove to people oh no look at me. I'm coming in gnarly harder than anybody, yeah. probably taking an eighth of what they're doing and not running myself into the ground. And so it can be done with this. And I think that is the, the, the carries the most weight on changing the industry in my mind, because a lot of my clients follow you and they go, Oh my God, Jewett's thing was, it was really good. I, I listened to, I learned a lot. I understand what you're saying. Like it, that's so important to see that. Do you know what I mean? Where people can see the physique, see the method, be like, whoa, he is really achieving that physique versus somebody being like, that's five grams of gear right there. Oh, maybe that is what I have to do. Do you know what I'm saying? Because oh, yeah. you need more people like yourself doing that and achieving that, telling others this is what can be done. Because at the end of the day, I know people rather do that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's a tough one. Like, I, I am glad like to be at this level and, and be able to, I feel like it helps me bridge the gap from like the science nerds that have like the information, but they just don't have the client base or the pro or they're not the pro to like cross over to be like, Hey, I'm in that tribe too, guys. I'm the top, your top pros. Um, this is what I'm doing. Check it out. And there's so much more open and receptive to hear it from me versus some like natural pro that just read a bunch of studies. Right. Um, so it does help, you know, cro cross that barrier a, a little bit more for sure. Um, a lot more, dude, a lot more, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> a, a lot more. <laughs> I hear people all the time and like, you know, my clients be like, dude, and I, this, this is it made like, Jew, it's fucking peeled. Like you like, and they'll ask me, they're like, you think he's halo. really doing what he's saying he's doing as far as low gear. I'm like, bro, I know John, I can tell you, it's that or it's even less. And they're like, no. And they're like, okay, all right, I I'm a believer because they see it and now they're gonna believe it. And they trust me because they're asking me. Do you know what I mean? And I know you. That's such a thing that you just brought up too is like getting someone to believe in the process. We talked about this way earlier on. It's like when you have that negative mindset, you don't believe in your plan. It's the plan's not gonna work, you know, it, to it's its fullest. Work. It's like, that's why like you educate someone on that approach, like, hey, I don't think this low gear thing's gonna work. It's like, let me teach you and let me give you that that understanding and that empowerment. And then once you believe in it, oh man, they'll take off with it, you know, and improve. It's, it's, it's such like that learning aspect needs to take place. I got two examples of the power of the mind. How many times have you seen somebody go from, you could argue and say a better, more experienced coach who didn't do very well to a lower tier coach and that client did better? Yep. Right. I've had clients come from some of the best coaches in the industry and they're like, man, it's, it, I didn't, I didn't like it. I mean, I did look decent, but I just, I, I don't know if it was, I, I want to try you. I'm like, I'm looking at myself. I'm like, all right, man, I'll give him a shot. And the dude kills it and he looks way better. And it's like, is that a matter of belief? Is he believing more? Is there less doubt? Uh, and then one particular incident, I had a client, my client in Germany was in friends with him now. He used to get so much anxiety about the show date coming in closer and closer. So much anxiety that you, he get to like five weeks out, you stop progressing. I'm, I'm like, my man, I go, you got to pull back. You got to relax. He's like, I, I don't know if I'm going to be ready. I don't know if I'm going to be ready. I'm like, dude, you're going to be ready. I'm like, this is what we're going to do. 
we're pulling your show date, but we're going to keep prepping. And then you're going to send me the schedule in Germany of all the bodybuilding shows. And then once we're two weeks out, then I'm going to tell you but right now <laughs> there is no date on the table. I shit you not that following week, he loses three pounds. Wow. And then he starts progressing, getting harder and harder. And I'm like, I'm like, all right, man, we're two weeks out. He's like, really, really? I love the way I'm looking. I'm like, dude, I told you it's just the mindset. And then every year I prepped him, we did the same thing. That's, I go, give me your hilarious. schedule. I go, we're going to, we're going to compete between October, and November. Are these, is this five week gap something that you can commit to? Absolutely. All right, let's do it. And he would just progress like crazy. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Like if you have someone that can have that, that opened into prep, it, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a deal. It's a good, a good idea. Yeah, um, but see, you know, how many times people get a little closer to prep and like all of a sudden just results just stop. Yeah. Some thought process can be, well, you're getting low enough body fat where the body is starting to fight you. Yeah, that's that's very true concept. A lot of the times also anxiety starts to go way up. They start to get a little nervous. They start focusing on who's competing, who they're competing against, which I think is stupid. They start looking at other people's training and they maybe start adding extra drop sets and they start doing all this little extra things on the side because they think that's going to speed them along or help them when it starts to make them go the other way. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going back because you brought, you brought up something of uh, when we're talking about gear usage and expectations, then uh, what you see other people doing. And um, it, it's, it's a nice conversation to have about safer use and laying this expectation of what we want to do long-term with someone but there's, there's some clients that I've worked with that when we get to the show day and that placing isn't what they want to, for one, their, uh, their, their needs and what they want for a placing or for a status, that's where they're at still. They're not looking at this like for their self-development of themselves. But anyway, a lot of times for these clients, like the, at the end of the day, that placing is what matters and they don't care that they took a safer route. That's a more of a, a longer term look at, at competing. And I see this a lot with females too, um, especially more so WPD. And so they came from a coach that had a very aggressive PED regimen and the progress on prep was very different, right? They like grow into the show. Um, you know, they made the most gains possible, but then they're all fucked up afterwards. They're like, Hey, I, I don't want to get masculine. I, I want to use less. And it's like, okay, well, this is going to be a different kind of, you know, prep. And then they don't see the, the placing that's there. They're like, fuck this. I'm going back to some other coach, you know? Uh, and so really at the end of the day, some of these females, they really don't care about losing femininity. It's just about getting there to where they want to in, in, in result. But I will say like, I have to probably, I, 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 I attract what I put out information wise right so if i put out this this model of how i do things this thought process usually i get those kind of clients but now and now and then when i get i get one that's like yeah that sounds great let's do it but deep down it, it's really hey i want to push gear hard and i don't care about the effects truly i don't um <laughs> they I, will I, eventually <laughs> they will maybe eventually um yeah. i don't know it's like and this is man it's crazy like i've seen um I worked with a wellness competitor that came from a wellness guru and the drug regimen was more than I have any WPD client on. And her prep was like, Hey, I grew into the show. Um, it, she was on this stuff for like 20 weeks, rotating out different compounds. It made no sense. It was fucking ridiculous. One week was Winstrol, The next week was equipoise and it was fucking crazy. And I'm like, and she, and she, um, you know, there was health issues. So we were addressing those addressing what needed to take place. And then when I'm like, hey, you can't prep this year because of the things that we we're trying to do, peace, I'm going to a different coach, you know, um, so deep down. And, and it's also like, why can't I grow into my show this year? Oh, because we don't want you to be a man after a year. Oh, well, OK, that doesn't really matter to me because that's still what I want to compete. <laughs> so it's like all across it's all across divisions. But again, like for females look at the, look at your master's level clients, your females that have been doing this for 10 years, even if they're just taking a little bit, like you do this for long enough, it, it will catch up. Look at some even bikini pros that have been doing this for a while. Like masculization is there. When you look back at where they first started that. Look at Jenny Lynn figure. O, way back in the day, Monica Brandt, like 
talk about progression of everything. Yeah. It, yeah. It's mind boggling. But what you just said, it's like you attract people, you attract people based on what you put out there. And I, same similar with me. I, I really don't get a lot of people that come to me with who want to do tons of stuff. When Matt Porter passed, I had like 50 clients of his try to come to me and all the things they wanted to take or what they were taking. I'm like, dude, I, I don't have any part in this. Like, I don't want any yeah. part in this. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, that's just not how I work. That's not how I, how to work. Um, I just feel uncomfortable with it. I'm not, I'm not doing it. Um, but it, it's, it's a, it's an unfortunate route, but like you just said, it's like, I'm not, you are not going to change your methods. I'm not going to change mine just based on what people want to do in that regard. Um, I, I just think that people sometimes do need to think a little bit outside the box in the future and longevity Anybody who's been in this sport, Dexter Jackson, anybody who's been competing for an astronomical long time being successful didn't do dumb shit because at, at some point your body is like, if you're born a Honda Civic and you want to make it a Porsche 911, you're going to have to do a hell of a lot of mods into that car. And that car is not going to go 100,000 miles. It's just not. <laughs> so it's like you kind of, kind of play your cards right with what you have. Um, and, and that's the name of the game. Uh, back you said about placings though. It's difficult sometimes when you get a client do a show that's not competitive, they get second or they win. Then they do a show, a regional show, so it's like you could say it's a lateral transfer, and it's a lot more competitive. The lineup is stacked, and they get fourth, and they're like, "I didn't progress." I'm like, yeah. "Bro, look at the lineup. Like your line, you you're eight pounds heavier with better condition, and your lineup would have." destroyed last year's competition and the whole thing like you, you got to understand that it, like your placing is not it's not a award for your hard work or your lack of progression it's just who showed up that day and that's i think that's a difficult people difficult thing for people to grasp and they constantly be reminded of that <clears throat> oh, absolutely and even some of these divisions progress so quickly like you look at any of them figure wpd even like five years ago it's a different level of physique and and so you wait out a year to grow and you get this new run of of females coming up or new genetic individuals that it's just your lineup isn't comparable like in 2019 i did the olympia i got fourth it's like holy shit like this is high up there look at that lineup like it, there was a lot of guys that were kind of on their way on their way out like these you know older competitors um, it just, it was, it, it was quality, but this year, if you look at the level, like I haven't even, I haven't been able to win a show because these new guys coming up are fucking awesome. You know, yeah, and, yeah. uh, this Olympia is going to be way more competitive than the one that I did. So it's like, Oh, John, you got fourth. If I don't get third, well, fuck. It's like, Oh man, there, it's a whole nother Olympia, whole nother lineup. Um, so to say like, Oh, well, you got worse. Well, that's not necessarily the case. I just bring the best version of myself. And that's what I really need to compare back to and keep trying to do that. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, that I know that Luke, you know, that it, it's difficult when the general public goes, Oh, what happened? Yeah. It's like, Oh my God, you just, yeah, you just don't understand. <laughs> yeah. You still yeah. understand, dude. It's like, it, it, you can kind of almost uh, stimulate it to fighting. It's like, you could go against a fighter who's not as good as you, but he just catches you wrong. And, and you eat it and you get knocked out by somebody you shouldn't have. It's just like, sometimes things just occur. You might be overall better bodybuilder than a lot of people and things might not work. Or it just, the progression of competitiveness is just linear. And it seems to be more that way. More genetics are coming out of the group, more crazy shape with muscle bellies and muscularity. And I, it's funny, I get this question a lot. I noticed the guys are just getting a little gnarlier. Are they using more and more and more drugs? I'm like, listen, the concept of using more drugs is very simple. It just means I'm gonna double my dose. If that was the case, every gym juice head weekend warrior would be out of control huge, yeah. <laughs> right? It's like, it's not that easy. It, it, it's, it's not related to just that, it's just not. And it, it's, it's a difficult thing to try to teach people when it keeps getting recurgitated back and misunderstood. <clears throat> it, it's kind of a, a separate, thing but I, I think with covid restrictions coming off some you're going to have a lot of guys and girls coming back into the competitive realms um i also think there's a lot of people that there's freaks out there 
that don't even don't even know they're freaks that haven't trained. And I think and you know, like you see a lot of these guys coming out of Egypt and that those areas where now there's like, you know, Rami having this huge influence and there's some like genetic freaks over there that are now yeah. coming into competitive world. So I, I think it's just uh, it, it's becoming more aware in other parts of the, of the world. Then also, I think with the travel being, you know, kind of brought back in some, you're, you're going to see like this other surge of competitiveness come through, I think, um, you know, it, it comes and goes, but at least like 2020 was probably like our, our most challenging year for, for competitive wise to where you have people that go to pro shows that turn pro that probably, you know, you probably wouldn't have in, in, in years before potentially. Um, um, something you just said, maybe remind me of this is, and this is corny to say this, but, and we do say this, your placing is not a recognition of your progress or effort, which people keep attaching to. I have to win, Chris. Why, why do you have to win? I just want to win. Oh, yeah, well, everybody else does too. But, you know, your overall goal and focus at the end of the day in bodybuilding is to be better every single time you step on stage. If you're getting better every single time you step on stage, then you are winning whether your place keeps improving or not. Yeah. Obviously, if it's the same group of guys, same judges, which is impossible, that never happens, then, and you keep placing the same, that sucks. But I mean, that means everybody else keeps getting better too. But that should be the primary focus. If you get off stage and you place worse with a better set of guys, but you're 10 pounds heavier, that should still make you happy. It's not just about, I won. I mean, I have some young guys who tell me, oh, I want to do the show. Oh, why do you want to do that show? Well, I know I can win it. I'm like, well, why do you think you can win it? Well, I know it's not going to be as competitive. I'm like, guy, like, what, what are we, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? You know, that's, 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 you should be moving past that, keeping your expectations on something that's way, way uh, out of your grasp. So eventually you can be there. When I used to race motocross, I hated riding by myself or riding with the local novices at the track. I wanted to ride with people who are professionals at the time I was an amateur because they're way faster. And then I could try to match their speed or match their corner speed. I wanted to be around people who are way better. And that ultimately made me better, faster. So don't choose shows just because you know, you're going to crush them. You know, I think we're, I think we're seeing a lot of that too. with like just a, a false understanding of priorities with people in the industry. I think you, you made the point earlier about like 50% of the people that compete probably wouldn't compete if we weren't in the age that we were. And it's like, we're coming across people with some or a lot more people that don't have the priority of just loving the process. Right. Yes. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's where a lot of, I think a lot of these things that we discussed today kind of comes from is like, we keep getting better, not only as <clears throat> competitors ourselves, but as coaches, because we love the process. We want to learn. We want to learn a better way to do it. And then we start to put content out that reflects that progression over time. But in the day and age and where it's like Instagram, social media, I need the win in order to make notoriety for myself and things along those lines. It's, it's a mix in priorities. And that's like kind of where as coaches, we need to start to educate the clientele in order to be able to have them shift that priority into the process. And then they now see that self-actualization, which is the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs when we look at developing a client over time. Yeah, and, the, and this is the thing too. It's like, it's way more, it, it means way more when you're doing it truly for yourself than you are for people in your gym thinking you're the man. Like it, it's it, that whole process of chasing, I want to be the man in other people's eyes. That person's still empty inside because they're not just doing it for them. And like you said about loving the process, I don't know about you guys, but I have never done a prep once where I thought about quitting. Never. Even when, even with North Americans prep, which was probably stupid. This is John, this is back to, you know, us being stupid. I had ulcerative colitis. That's when I started to develop. I was shitting blood and mucus 12 to 13 times a day, but I was still doing like two hours of cardio a day. I didn't give a shit. I'd get off the machine like five times to go to the bathroom and come back. But like, I was so fatigued, but I didn't care. But never once I was like, Ah, this is too much for me. The only thing I thought about was like, ah, it's just just prep. It's just difficult. But like the process of pushing and achieving the goal was all I was focused with. And luckily back then, I wasn't even on social media. Um, 
in the, the process, people always say to me two years, people will say, I don't know how you guys continue to do that. It's because we're not chasing the trophy. We're still in love with the process. It's not like when we stop competing, we're just going to not eat healthy anymore. We're not going to train anymore. It's like, I'm done bodybuilding completely. I still eat extremely good and I still train. I might do a little extra boxing and do running or do other things, but like, I'm still living that type of same sort of grinding lifestyle, you know? Yeah. I think uh, you, you nail, like I was thinking about the Manslow's hierarchy of needs to the whole time we're talking. Right. And a lot of people are kind of on that lower level of just needing esteem, self-esteem, respect from others. And that that's just, it's, it's just a lower level until like, like you say, Chris, like what, what we really connect with is like this, we're on this ability to see this better version of ourselves. And that's, doesn't mean it's not a placing or what someone else deems you as being good enough last place or first place. It's seeing that out for within your own self that you've become better. And I think that's why I've, I've loved bodybuilding so much. It's not just physically getting better, but it causes, I've had to do so much self-reflection of the mental process that it's carried out in all other areas of my life, business. Yes. Yes. And it's not bodybuilding anymore. Just to me, it, it's been kind of a tool to create myself into this better potential. And, um, and, and that's, that's how I got through bodybuilding and, and what it kind of opened up to me and gave me this like greater purpose and it wasn't getting on stage and, and, and winning the trophy. And, and, and you brought up, um, you know, quitting a prep. And I, I have to say, like, I, in, in 2020, when I was prepping for that Olympia, I, I, that was the, a prep that I would, I would have quit. Um, and it's not because I, I couldn't push or handle it mentally or physically. It's because I knew I wasn't going to be ready at some point. And the thought of not improving myself to that better version was fucking killing me. Yeah. Um, and it, it seems like you're tracking back, but to get through that, and we have shows that are like that to where we might not be a better version and cause stuff doesn't always work out. Right. Um, and, and the body might not respond how you want it to, but at least you find areas for one, you love the process, but you also find areas that you can breathe that better version of yourself. Like, Hey, I, I'm, I'm not going to bring the condition that I want, but damn straight. I'm going to bring the best posing ability that I can or whatever it may be. There's reasons you might have to stop a prep, but at the same time, if you get, if you get too focused on how a negative aspect of it, um, it can take you down, down a wrong path and make the whole prep go to shit. But I, I think still, there's always some area that we can find that better version of ourselves, even, even when everything's not working out perfect. And that's, that's a, a thing too, is like no prep is ever going to be perfect. No job is ever going to be perfect or relationship. That doesn't mean you don't, you quit it. Uh, it, it it's, you find the ways to where you can still improve and then you have more self-reflection on what can I do now to make, make it even better. So going through that prep, going through other adversities that I've gone through, like that's how I got better because I had to think out and, and problem solve. And that problem solving was also creating a better you know, version of myself. So it's like the desire, the emotional and overwhelming desire to be a better bodybuilder creates the need to self-reflect and change, which transfers into other aspects of your life, relationship, business, and everything gets better. The same thing happened with me. I laugh at how pathetic I used to be 18, 19, 20 years old in my work ethic compared to now. I would run circles around myself, mentally, emotionally, and every aspect. It's like, but bodybuilding and my desire to be better is what created that mind is where I am now. It's like when I'm presented a problem in my relationship, you know, we, we, I, I look back, I don't point fingers like, oh, it's her fault. She, she's the one who did that to me. I look back and, and look at it all the same sort of process you do in bodybuilding. And, and that's, dude, that's where it's at. I tell my clients too, I'm like, dude, the day you become a really good bodybuilder is everything else in your life gets better too. You, you can use bodybuilding to destroy your entire life because many people do and they don't get better. Or when you really start to be a better bodybuilder, everything else gets better as well. I was just going to say that like, if you're seeing other parts in your life fall apart and get worse, 
you, you're probably bodybuilding for the wrong reasons, um, potentially. Because for me, when I've done the best in bodybuilding, usually everything else is doing really well. Um, or I've done well in bodybuilding too. That's not to say that I haven't, but I destroyed a lot of other shit that was around me too. Um, and, and that was the realization I was just doing it for the wrong reasons. And once I'm doing it for the right reasons, that's when everything seems to, to really grow around me. Or people, I would call people, people redline it. They just spin their wheels. They're putting in way too much mental effort and focus and not gaining any traction, which is taking away from every aspect of their life because all their energy is on one thing. Your energy needs to be on bodybuilding a lot. It really does. And there's no question about it, much more than a lot of other sports and endeavors, but it doesn't need to be take the obsession 24 seven and neglecting other parts of your life. It just doesn't. Quitting your job and prep, so just, that's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I've had, I had one client like, well, I have to stop coaching. It's like, okay, what's, what's going on? I understand. It's like, well, I have all these credit card bills from, um, from supplements. So it was like putting all the, like, their supplements and all their prep, like on a credit card to like, just get through I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is a terrible prioritization. Like you shouldn't even prep, you know, like yeah, no. you, you just get stable in your job. Like, um, so yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of prioritization that use does need to occur <laughs> before yeah, like, sure. red, red line your prep and go all in. Right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It, you know, one thing I think that makes your message, my message, Luke's message, a little more difficult for people to grasp is we all know that social media only portrays what portrays to others, what that person wants to portray. Right. So they're seeing the tip of the iceberg of what they want you to see. And that gives them a false interpretation of the process yeah. of what it's about changes to expectations kind of steers them generally in the wrong direction mentally, which is difficult to see happen because I, I know people personally who are just shit bags to the core and their life's falling apart. But you look at their social media and they're like, this is the most successful guy alive right now. This is, yeah. this, this guy's amazing. You know? Um, and that becomes a very difficult obstacle that people just lose that. I like your situation where you will present the problem too. It's not all peaches and cream all the time. You know what I mean? Like, this is what's happening. This is what happened. Here's my physique. Where a lot of people will only show their physique in the best lighting. Yeah. In the best, best shots and only their best poses at two weeks out. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll show my fast and shitty pics. Be like, man, John, how are you going to compare? Like, well, here, bitches, here's my post workout pick, looking fucking rowdy. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, well, we're we're a little like uh, past an hour here, Chris. I won't I won't hold you up any longer. I know this kind of went a different route, which is a, it's a great route because it shows you how impactful the mental aspect of this is. And I think a lot of people listen to it or will pull that out and be able to hopefully like think about the self-reflection aspect and what they need to apply within themselves what, and what, how they should be communicating to the coach to really get more out of the whole process. And I think doing so will make you love the process more. You'll find it more enjoyable too. Yeah, just an ending note, I agree with 100%. Communication on the client side is, is mandatory, it's needed. I have clients that getting information, I was like pulling teeth sometimes. Um, and they, or they just don't know how to describe it. And I just asked my dad, I'm like, dad, being a doctor and asking like a patient what's going on, is it ever difficult to get information out of them? And he's like, oh my gosh, it is. <laughs> Why are you here today? Uh, I, I got pain. Oh, pain where? Ah, everywhere. Okay. You know, it'd be more specific, but it's kind of coaching them to understand how to communicate properly. And the other thing too about mental, and I'll end it here is I, for those of you who know about motocross, Ricky Carmichael is like the most winningest racer in all motorsports history. And he was interviewed one time on what makes him so much better than everybody else. And he said that 99% of the guys out here have the speed to win, but only 1% actually have the mental fortitude to carry a winning streak. And I'm like, wow, for him to say that versus yeah. like, I mean, he's winning every single race he does by like a landslide and him to say that these guys are just as good as me. I just had a better up here, you know? That's huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chris, before we go is, I, I know you, I don't think you take any more clients on, but um, for people to just get more of your information because you do some education stuff 
Is it mainly just through IG? Uh, yeah, I have a website, TuttleNutrition.com. And obviously my IG is Ivy Pro Chris Tuttle. Um, and I have a Tuttle Nutrition page on Instagram, which, you know, my wife and I do a lot of general pop population clients, clients with digestive disorders, diabetes management. That's really the, honestly, the bulk of my, my clientele. And obviously I prep people because I love prepping people on the side, but I, I yeah, I have about a four month wait list. I'm not taking any more clients on really at this time or adding to that list. I want to work through what I have. And most importantly, I got to be able to make sure I spend attention to the competitors that I need because yeah. I, I, I draw my line on, I, I don't want to help any more than five competitors compete in one weekend. That's my cap. That's you heavy know, after that. I know that. Yeah. After that, especially if they're all different shows, different time zones, I just, that's just too stressful. I'm not interested in that. Well, uh, again, Chris, thanks for coming on, man. We really appreciate it. It's always good. Good to hear you chat. You have such yeah, a, an, a practical approach, but also it's, it's science minded. So that's just exactly what we, we preach around here. So again, um, thanks for your time, man. Yeah, no problem, John. See you later, Luke. Yeah. All right. Thanks everybody for tuning in J3U podcast. Like, share, subscribe, and we will talk to you next time.